Hey guys, we're about to jump into the message today, but before we do, special announcement, Transformation Church Conference. That is right, we are getting so close. It is coming up September 10th through the 12th. Listen, you need to get your tickets. This is gonna be an amazing time. It's Transformation Conference version one. What do we mean by that? We mean that you can start right where you are, putting out the first version, the first iteration, even if it's rough, even if it's not all the way put together, we believe that you're gonna get something so special out of this conference. Go to our website, our social media, our app, get your ticket today, because it's going to be amazing. But for now, let's jump to the message. We're gonna get into the word today. Do you love the Bible? Make some noise if you love the Bible. How many of you have a real Bible with you today? Like you didn't have to charge your Bible. Raise your, if you've got a real Bible, man, I'm so excited. We're going to get in heaven first, right? They're going to show us. Your Bible's going to be dead when you get up there. It'll be like, I still got mine. <laughs> hey, uh, man, this word today is very, very special. Very special and very powerful. And I'm not saying that because uh, I've preached it three times and I know how powerful it is. What I'm saying is that God gave it to me in a very specific way. And my prayer all week is that I would be able to give it to you like God gave it to me. This is literally a life altering message. I'm going to say it right in the beginning. And anybody that's been in any other service, they're like, yeah, it is. It's, It's so powerful. And what you need to know is, is this is not the work of me. This is the work of the Bible. The Bible never returns void, meaning it is a book that is not simply just a book, but it has underlying power that when you read it, it speaks into your situation. It speaks into your life. There's revelations. There's things in there. You can literally read one verse for the rest of your life and get revelation every single day because that's how it works. That's how God works. And today we're going to be in some familiar scripture, but I want to challenge your familiarity with the scripture because here's why. I think the, one of the biggest tools that the enemy would use is not a giant attack, but simply for you to become familiar with the Bible. To think, oh, I've heard that before. Think about what happens when you become familiar with something. You become familiar with your spouse. There was a season where you were really trying to get them to check you out. You were taking showers. You were brushing your teeth. You maybe not wouldn't eat ice cream every time you wanted it at all because you were thinking, you know what? I'm trying to get the attention of this person. But once you become familiar, you stop doing certain things. You stop treating them a certain way. You stop. That's one of the biggest attacks of the enemy for you to become familiar with your walk with Jesus. To think, oh, I've got it. I've figured it out. So today, this word is going to be so potent, so powerful, uh, and it really has the potential to change your life. And so I want you to turn with me to 1 Samuel 17, starting in, uh, we're going to start in verse 4. Verse 4. And uh, I'm going to take a moment to pray, to ask that God would speak to us clearly uh, in a very specific way today because I really believe he wants to do it. Lord God, we love you and we need you. We don't need just moments in a building so we can pat ourselves on the back. We don't just need to sing songs. We need to encounter the Holy Spirit because, Holy Spirit, you're the one that makes the difference. You're the one that allows us to step into who we've been called to be. So, Holy Spirit, I ask for your strength, ability, wisdom, and discernment as this message goes forward. I thank you that every word that comes out of my mouth would not be from me but from you. God, our hearts are open, and we are ready to hear what you have to say. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. And everybody say it. Amen. Turn in your Bibles, 1 Samuel 17, verse 4. It's a story you've never heard of before called David and Goliath. Then Goliath, a Philistine champ from Gath, came out of the Philistine ranks to face the force of Israel. He was over nine feet tall. He wore a bronze helmet, a bronze coat of mail that weighed 125 pounds. He also wore bronze leg armor. He carried a bronze javelin on his shoulder. He was dripping in bronze, if you hear what I'm saying. The shaft of his spear was heavy and thick. The tip of his iron spearhead weighed 15 pounds. His armor bearer walked ahead of him carrying a shield. Goliath stood and shouted a taunt across to the Israelites. Why are you all coming out to fight, he called. I'm a Philistine champion, but you're only the servants of Saul. Choose one man to come down here and fight me. If he kills me, then we will be your slaves. But if I kill him, you will be our slaves. I defy the armies of Israel today. Send me a man who will fight me. When Saul and the Israelites heard this, they were terrified and deeply shaken. The title of my message is You Can't 
punk me no more. I got, I got a real uh, attitude today against the enemy. And I'm coming to serve notice that you cannot punk me no more. You're not, I, I'm, I'm, I'm just, the t I'm about to, oh my goodness, I'm about to preach, goodness gracious. Okay. So me and my wife have a beautiful baby boy named Arlo. And I love him so much. He's so good looking. He's so precious. Uh, I, there were things that come, oh my goodness gracious, look at that. I mean, if you ain't getting saved after that picture, I don't know what you're doing. That's Arlo. I love him so much. And here's the thing with my baby boy. I'm in a season where I'm just dreaming. Like, I'm just dreaming, like, what is it going to be like? What he just started laughing, and he start, he's getting so chunky, like he has, like, four necks. It's so amazing. Like, he's just so fat, and I just kiss him right out of the mouth, and I just love it. It's so awesome. And so I'm thinking, what is he going to like? What is he going to be like? What's his personality going to be like? What is he, he going to be into it? And part of me thinks he's going to like music. Because on Saturdays, I like to go record shopping, and I go get records, and we play them in our record player at the house. And I love just old records. Like, I love playing some Carla Thomas, some Luther Vandross. Like, so, see, some of y'all thought of the little keys. Like, who's that light-skinned boy with the blonde hair? Come on, don't play me up here. I, I know some good stuff. Well, I love li listening to records, and I will always sit there and just stare at the record, just watch it go round and round and round. And part of me hopes he likes music. The other part of me is a little nervous that he's going to like sports. Now, he here's why I'm nervous. Because I am way too emotional and way too wild to be a sports dad. Because I've already decided I will fight a six-year-old on sight. Like, if you gonna mess with my boy, I'm already to fight. Like, I'll fight another baby right now for Arlo. I just, I've always been that way. I'm competitive, I'm in it, I'll just talk trash. It's a part of my life I'm really trying to give to God, so pray for me. But I just, I've just always been that way. Growing up, I played basketball and football at this uh, Christian school, and the school was so small, we played the same four teams in all sports every year. Same four teams. It was like we grew up with them. They're like our brothers and sisters at the end of the year. It's like, oh, hey, how you doing? Wow, you gotten taller. It's good to see you, man. How's your mom doing? Like, it's just we knew them so well, and one game, uh, this team was Good Pasture was the name of their team, and I got so into it with the other point guard. He fouled me, clearly because he couldn't guard me. So he fouled me, and I was like, that's right, you fouled me. That's the only chance you got against me. Like, I'm just talking. I was literally like 4, 10, 80 pounds, just like talking all this trash. And we literally started shoving each other back and forth. We got in a fight. The ref gave both of us a technical, threw us out of the game. And I was like, yeah, I'm a gangster. Like, this, that's, that's what it is. But I was just emotional. Like, I started crying. I was so mad. Fast forward, we play them uh, in football. And when we played them in football, we would always, it would be a close game. But I was fairly decent at football. Now, not extremely good because I'm here talking to you and not in the NFL making millions of dollars somewhere. But I was fairly decent. And so anytime we would win, there would just be an array of trash talk that would happen over the summer because we would see them kind of have the fr same friend circles. Where Fast forward, we beat them. The next year in football, the game's about to start. And I'm ready. You know, I'm pumped up again this tall. But I'm excited. Seventh grade year, you know, it's like this is a new year. We're about to whoop up on these fools. I know all of them, and they ain't got nothing on us. Like, I'm just hyping myself. It's all in my head, just hyping myself up. And I'm standing in the back waiting for the, the other team to walk onto the field so we can start the game. And I'm standing there, and I'm like, all right, I'm thinking, and I'm looking down, like, okay, this game's going to be good, and I'm thinking through it. And literally, I look up, and then these grown men <laughs> with beards, probably young children start to walk onto the field and I'm thinking who are you you have a beard and you just kissed your wife before you walked out on this field what are what are you and I started looking I was like and I looked over to the sidelines and everybody that we used to play was on the bench they were just sitting down there like just like chilling just quiet and I was like why aren't y'all who are they like that is your dad you sent your dad out here I was literally, I got so afraid. I was like, okay, they have hired like a college team to come act like they're in sixth grade and they are about to destroy us. I'm literally, I'm sitting there and the game actually is pretty close and I'm surprised and I'm about to get the ball and I'm like, okay, we just need to score a touchdown. The game's coming to an end. We can actually win this thing. I get the ball. I take one step and no lie, Goliath <laughs> from 1 Samuel 17 
verse 4 is standing right here. I do like a slow motion, like, Literally, this is the most disrespectful thing that's ever happened to me. This man scooped me up like some ice cream. He scooped me up and had me on his shoulder like you do to your little cousin when you're about to throw him on the bed. He had me on his shoulder. I'm up on his shoulder like, you are strong. You are. I'm up. He literally scoops me up and then slams me down on my head. And he's like, whoa, standing over me. Literally, I'm just laying there like, I see you, Lord. <laughs> I'm laying there, and, and the, the, everybody, like, freaked out. Like, it got really quiet. At first, I was just stunned, and then I was just laying there like, what just happened to me? <laughs> but then the, the emergency team, they run out, and they're like, hey, you landed on your head. That looked very, uh, very rough. What, are you okay? How are you feeling? Because I just kind of laid there for a second. And I was like, well, my neck kind of tingles. Like, my neck kind of tingles, and my shoulders are kind of tingling. And it feels like I hit my funny bone, like, all down my back. And they were like, and all of a sudden, it got very serious. They called 911. The ambulance drove out onto the football field. They stopped the whole game. My mom and dad come down from the stands. I remember my mom, she was crying. They literally had me sitting exactly still. They put a neck brace on you. They, they had to cut my jersey off. They lifted me up onto the ambulance and put me in the back of the ambulance. I go to the emergency room. And what had happened in football, there's something that can happen called a stinger. And pretty much the, what happens is you hit somebody and it literally sends like a sting or a tingle down your spine. But when you're talking about it, it sounds very similar to someone who could be going paralyzed from hurting their neck. And it was a very serious moment and I turned it out to be okay. I had to wear a neck brace for like a week or something. And then I ended up healing from it and it was actually fine and was cleared to play football that next year. But when I came back that next year, something was different. Something was a little off. I noticed that I played different. That as I would run, if I was getting close to out of bounds, instead of trying to go forward, I would just scoot out of bounds. If someone was coming for me and, and right when they hit me in the past, I would kind of push forward and maybe fight a little more and think, can I break this tackle or can I get them off of me? But now I would just kind of fall down. And what I noticed, I think it was my dad who actually pointed out, he said, it seems like you stopped running to score and now you're just running to not get hit. It feels like, some, like you don't, it's not the same. And what happened is I went from, from fighting in the fight to, to being afraid and fearful. And then at one point, I would just forfeit it. I would just say, you know what? Like, brother, you don't even have to tackle me. Look at this. I am down. Don't even worry about it, brother. I... <laughs> but I noticed what happened is that there was a real moment of hurt. A real moment of pain. And what happened is, is that moment was now projected onto my future. And I was walking in this mindset and in these thoughts and in this ideology that I was afraid of that what could happen or what did happen would happen at this moment. And now it affected how I lived my life. It affected the, the steps I took or didn't take. It affected the people I would or wouldn't talk to. And can I tell you that over a decade later, Years and years have gone by, and it's the same thing. It's just a different situation. The enemy does this in our life. He takes a moment where there was real pain, real hurt, a real struggle. And what he does is he wants you to, 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 to hit this moment and to feel the pain and to experience, because what he knows is if he can just make you feel it and, and it really hurt one time, that's all he needs. Here's what any good bully knows. And I'm not encouraging or condoning bullying, but a bully knows you only have to hit the person hard one time. Because after you hit them hard once, your only job is to remind them of what happened the first time. Yeah. And that's what the enemy does. He just reminds you. Hey, remember what happened last time you trusted somebody? Remember the last time you stepped out in faith? Remember the last time you, you prayed and prayed and prayed and it didn't happen? Remember that time? And now what happens is you've, there was a real moment of hurt, and I want to acknowledge this and be so sensitive because there are very real things that people have experienced in this room and watching. But what happens is the enemy will take that moment, and he will project it onto your future and get you to accept that that's just the way it is, and now you should live your life out of that place. Translation, that a, mo a real moment happened when you were six. Like you were really hurt. 
But what happens is you don't realize that you've actually healed from that moment. Like you still have the scar to show that it happened, but on the inside of you, everything has come back into alignment. But you're still acting and living in the mindset that it still happened. You're, you, there was one time where you weren't insecure and you stepped out and put yourself out there and somebody said something about you and it caused you to step back. And with the enemy, all, all he has to do now, he doesn't even have to actually touch you. He doesn't even have to actually fight you. He can do what, what a bully would do, and that's called punking you. He can just say, hey, 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 remember what happened? Remember the last time? Remem-? And here's what the enemy, he has been punking God's people out of their purpose for years. And he hasn't, the truth is, he hasn't even touched you. Like he hasn't, he's just used this one moment and reminded you over and over and over again. And what's crazy is if this happens long enough, followers of Jesus will start to find scripture to justify the enemy punking you. And you may not realize this, but this is something I've noticed in my own life growing up and around church. And there's a scripture in 2 Corinthians 12. And it's a very powerful piece of scripture. And there are moments in my walk with Jesus that I've held on to the scripture and And it's really brought a lot to me. And it's Paul talking. And he says, you know, I've seen a lot. I've done a lot. But to keep me from becoming proud, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger from Satan to torment me, to keep me from becoming proud. It goes on to say that three times I begged the Lord to take it away. And each time he said, my grace is all you need. It's sufficient. It's enough. It's and the scripture is so amazing. But what happens sometimes is when it comes to your giant, when it comes to the thing you're facing, what the thorn was, was a struggle or a a pain or a challenge that was present to push you to God. He was saying, it would be a nature of mine to become proud. So to keep me from becoming proud, God put this thorn that was present in my life. And every time I saw it, I was supposed to turn and go to God. But what happens is, and it's very slight, sometimes we will take what God made present and we make it permanent. There's a difference if I'm present at your house and if I'm permanent at your house. When I show up to your door and I'm present and I knock on the door, when that temptation shows up and knocks on your door, the the, the reason that that was there is it was present for you to close the door and say, I got to go to God about this one. But what happens is, is many of us, because we've been in chains so long, because we've been in that mindset so long, because the enemy has punked you for so long, what God made present, you take it and you make it permanent. That this is just always how it's going to be. My mom struggled with this. My dad struggled with this. So I'm just going to struggle with it. There's nothing I can do about it. I'm always going to walk in lust. Can't really do anything about it. None of the men on my family have integrity. I can't really do anything about it. I'll never learn to manage money. Can't really do anything about it. I can't. And now you're walking in the same place, not because God hasn't freed you from it, but because you picked it up and took off walking. It's so and I'm thinking of this illustration and, 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 and it's so crazy powerful. You know, the African elephant is one of the most strongest animals in the world. It's one of the well, you really down for elephants. Right there? Come on. But as a do you know how they keep. African elephants from moving, a rope tied to a stick, two inches in the ground. Strongest animal in the world, it won't move. Won't even try. Why? Because as a baby, when it's really small, they take a metal stake and they stick it in the ground and they take a metal chain and they tie it to its leg. And the elephant tries to fight. It tries to get out. It pulls and pulls and pulls, and it pulls so hard until it literally rubs its leg raw. And the elephant will sit there and try to fight and try to get out, and eventually it just gives up. And it can be a full-grown adult elephant, and they will tie a piece of string around its leg and connect it to a stick and put it in the ground, and it will not move. Not because it doesn't have the power to move, but because it's accepted that this is just how it is, and I tried to get out once before, and I tried... 
That's what the enemy does. He just gets you in a space where you said, you know, when you were five and you tried to be all God had called you to be, or you were 10 and you tried to step out and tell your mom that, that you had a dream or that you wanted to be something, and he uses that scar from when you were little to now you're a grown person and you won't move. It's the enemy, he's trying to, he just, he's trying to punk you. He's, he's just reminding you. He's just saying that you, you can't do it. You, you, there's no way you've tried before. And what, I, what is so crazy is it's the same move that he's doing in 1 Samuel 17. Goliath is punking the entire Israel army. They haven't fought. He comes out and is like, hey, what's up? I'm a champion. I'm nine feet tall. I got all this bronze on. Some of y'all come down here and fight me right now. And literally it says that the Israel army was on one side on the mountain. The other army was on the other side. And no one would come down. No one would challenge him. This is what the enemy does. He attacks and he tries to punk our purpose. And I want to identify three ways that he does it. The enemy punks purpose by attacking your perception. Here's what I mean by that. The view of Goliath physically was what the enemy now does mentally to many of us. He's not new. He's just bigger. Here's what I mean. They had actually fought the Philistine army three times before this battle. And guess what? They had never lost. Never. They had never. There was literally in 1 Samuel 7, they're fighting this army and it's getting close. And literally all of a sudden the spirit of God comes on the Philistine army and they start killing each other. It just... They had never lost against this battle. But all of a sudden, the view, the perception was bigger. It was just, it wasn't new, it was bigger. Translation, your fear that you struggle with right now, it's not new, it just feels bigger. Your, your insecurity, it's not new, it just feels bigger. And this is what the enemy's after. He's after your perception because your perception will always determine your progress. Against truth against what's actually on the inside of you, how you view it, what you're looking at, if you think it's bigger than you, whether if it's true or not, will always determine if you move forward. And he knows that. He knows that it's, I'm not, he's not as concerned with your problem as he is of how big you think your problem is. If you think it's just, I, I can't beat that. It's too big. It's just, I'm no match for that, for that fear. I'm no match for the struggle in my marriage. I'm no match for these financial pressures that I'm experiencing. I'm no match for raising these kids by myself. And the enemy just projects this huge, this huge version of this challenge, of this fear, just to make you think that you can't do it and to keep you on your side. It's crazy to me that Goliath was able to talk all this trash and he hadn't fought anyone. Like it wasn't like they came down, he beat up one of the dudes and the guy came with the bloody eye and was like, yeah, dog, don't go mess with Goliath. He just, he was just bigger. And what's crazy is in this story, we often label the story of David and Goliath. You even hear this as a sports term or just as a very crazy outweighed mismatch like David and Goliath. Oh, it's in the NCAA tournament. It's a David and Goliath scenario. This fight was very much a mismatch, but not in the way that we've labeled it. If you study the original context of this story and really study scholars, and, and look at some of the details of Goliath, anybody that is that tall, over nine feet tall, the only way that that happens is actually a disease. It's called acromegalia. And it's a disease that attacks your growth hormones. And it causes you to grow at an exponential rate, but it also shortens your life expectancy. It makes your bones extremely weak and brittle. It makes you have double vision. It makes you to respond very, very slow to to movements and to swings. When David came down that mountain to fight Goliath, it was a mismatch. Not because David was, was, was scared and small, but David was a slinger. Now, you've probably not heard of this term, but during that time, there was a piece of the infantry that were slingers. And when he released that stone at Goliath's head, it wasn't like a little, like, oh, he shot a little rock. That rock would have left at the same velocity as a 45 caliber gun. You see, the fight was actually a mismatch. But the enemy will will project himself. He will make himself seem so big to keep you from ever coming down that hill. Because he knows if you ever came down, 
if you ever got out of that place of insecurity, if you ever would admit that you had pride and would humble yourself, if you ever came down, it would not be a match. But he's got your perception. He's got your view. He's got you thinking that you could never face it. It's too big. It's too tall. You can't do it. The second thing he goes after, it's similar, but it's different. It's your perspective. So your perception is what you see. Your perspective is how you see it. Small but different. There are two totally different perspectives in this story. There's the perspective of the Israelite army. And the perspective of the Israelite army, if you read the scripture in 1 Samuel 17 verse 1, in the scripture, the first people to move are the Philistine army. The first people to make a motion to attack, the Philistines attacked and set up camp. And then it says Saul countered or he responded to the attack of the Philistine army. The perspective from the Israelite army was that the attack was sent to them. And that's what a lot of our lives feel like. It feels like those thoughts that keep coming after you, that they were sent for you. The attack, the attack on your marriage, the attack on your purpose, the attack on your confidence, it feels like this was sent for me and it keeps attacking me and it's coming after me. But there's a, there's a slight difference in David's perspective. You see, David's perspective, the title or, or, or the, the, the header over this portion of scripture is David is sent by Jesse. You see, the Israelites, they took the perspective that the battle or Goliath was sent for them. But David knew that Goliath was not sent for David. But in fact, David had been sent for Goliath. Could I present to you today that maybe you've been viewing your problems with the wrong perspective? What if and just maybe your problem was not sent to attack you, but you were actually sent to attack your problem? This is a small shift, but your giant was not after you. It was not sent to attack you. What if you were sent to attack it? And this is a different seat that you have to take. That it wasn't, oh, it's coming for me, oh, it's coming for me. But literally the scripture says, look at this, it's so, so crazy. It says it right here in uh, 1 Samuel verse 1. It says the Philistine mustered up their army. Ver go down to verse 17. One day Jesse said to David, take this bread of roasted grain to your brothers. His father sent him in to the situation. What if your father, your heavenly father, sent you? What if he sent you to that struggle? What if he sent you to that job? What if it wasn't that the job was coming for me and my boss is coming for me? What if your attitude was maybe my God sent me into that job so that I could help my boss get a different perspective? But And I can tell that your perspective has been so straightforward for so long that this idea that maybe you were supposed to attack it seems completely out of the question. It doesn't even seem real. What, what? This challenge that I've been facing since a teenager, you meant that actually God prepared me and sent me for it? Actually, yes. But the enemy, he's got your perception of it. He's got you thinking that you could never beat it. You could never get past it. You could never... It's just you'll always, you'll own, it's, it's your perspective. And here's what I found that's interesting in my own walk with Christ and is I've noticed that even if I get the right perception, meaning I understand the difference, that I understand that, okay, this isn't, this isn't bigger than me. It's not, it's not anything new. It's just the enemy's trying to make it feel bigger or make it feel like it's overwhelming or make me feel like I can't handle it. I got to understand that and I get the right view of that. And then I go to my perspective and I say, what if, you know, that I wasn't, this thing isn't attacking me, but what if I made the perspective shift that I was attacking it? What would happen? And what's crazy is those things can happen in your life. Like you can get the right perception and the right perspective. But can I let you in on a secret? The enemy don't really care. They say, Charles, why would you just preach those two points if they were not worth anything? I mean, they're there, and like the enemy will attack you in that way. That's why I put them in there. But there's a different thing that he does that has literally taken out hundreds of thousands of Christians. What he does is he's okay if you have the right perception and the right perspective, but what he knows is there's something that makes the difference. And what the enemy will do 
is you can get the right perspective, you can get the right perception, but he knows that if you don't have any real power, you could have the right view. You could look the right way. You could sound the right way. But without power, you're not effective. Without power, you can't be who you've been fully called to be. Without the power, and this is what the enemy does. He comes for your power. Look how he does it in scripture. Look, it's so clear. First Samuel verse 8, Goliath stood up and shouted a taunt across the Israelites. Why are you coming out to fight me? I'm a Philistine champion, but you're only servants of Saul. He disc, they were actually, the thing that made them a strong army and literally caused so many different armies to fear them is that they were the Lord's army. They were servants of God. But what Goliath did is he disconnected their power. He said, you're not a servant of the Lord. You're actually only a servant of Saul. And he connected them to a power that could do nothing for them. And this is what the enemy does. It's so slight. He'll take your power and say, you're, you're, you're not a servant of God. You're, you're just you. Like, you don't have what it takes. You, you don't. You're not, there's nothing different about you. And he's attacking our power. And I believe that this is the thing that literally has allowed the enemy to get such a foothold and a grasp of your life is because you thought if I just fought it harder, if I did more, if I, if I went to church more, can I tell you the enemy is not concerned that you're in church today? What he's concerned about is if you leave different. You can... You can go to church, you can show up to church, but until you get access to power, there will be nothing that can shift that moment. Can I? This microphone is effective. It's good. would be to steal your power. You know what? He's not after your mind. He's after your batteries. That's what he wants. He don't want the top of this microphone. He don't want the bottom of this microphone. He wants the only thing that can make a difference. And until you understand that the power of the Holy Spirit is the only thing that can make a difference, you will walk around looking the same, feeling the same, but there will be no power. It's the power of the Holy Spirit that makes the difference. That's it. And it's that simple and it's that plain. And I want to be very clear to you about it because if not, we could preach messages and we could yell and we could shout. But without the Holy Spirit, it is you helping you. That's what this is. If we don't talk about the Holy Spirit, it's about you. Who's going to give you the power to be a better person? You? Who's going to give you the power to beat the Goliath? You? Because you beating Goliath is not the story of the Bible. You saving yourself is not the story of the Bible. For God, it's the power. And here's the thing. You start talking about the Holy Spirit, and some people be like, Ooh, I, I, Holy Spirit, Holy Ghost, I don't know. I don't mess with ghosts. Don't, don't mess with ghosts on me. Oh, no, 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 no. And you know what's crazy? The enemy has made you afraid of your batteries. He's... He's made you afraid of the one thing that could actually do something. And I know, I know you may feel like this is weird. The Holy Spirit, what are you talking about? Is literally the Trinity of God. This is all Bible. This is not what Charles thinks. This is in the same Bible that you have. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And I want to be this straightforward about it. And I love you. And I'm not trying to come against you. But many of us would ignore an entire third of God and act like we're worshiping the same God. It's all Bible. I want to be very clear. You cannot turn your back to a third of who God is and then be frustrated when you don't have power to face what he's called you to face. 
And I understand that, that the Holy Spirit has had some really bad PR on the church's behalf. Like we've made him weird and creepy and scary and all this stuff. But the enemy's used that. He's used it for you to stay away from your power source. He's used it. And what you're doing is you, is you think, I just got to try harder. And if I just work harder and I, and I try a lot more and I do a lot more, then I'll be able to beat my giant. You have no power. You, if you could beat the thing you're facing, you would have done it already. And this is, if I could beat my, my struggle that I've had with lust in the past, if I could have beat it on my own, I would have done it a long time ago. But I had to have a realization that I, I don't have the power by myself. And as long as we keep coming to church and showing up and you can sit in a garage all you want to and that will not make you a car. In the same way you can show up to church and sit in church, but it doesn't change the, 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 the fabric of who you are. The thing that makes the difference, the thing that allows you to be who God has called you to be is the Holy Spirit. Here, what's crazy about uh, that story when I played football is that another game came around and we played the same team. And I was sitting and talking to my dad before the game was starting. And he said, Charles, you know what? What if you decided that you weren't going to get hit this game? I was like, I would be in the NFL immediately, Dad. That's what would happen. He said, no, like what if you didn't get hit, but you hit people, regardless if you had the ball or not? And it was a perspective shift that, you know what? I'm not going to let them hit me, but I'm going to hit them first. And the first play of the game, I got the ball, and the field was wide open, literally. It was like Jesus, part of the Red Sea. And I could see the end zone. I took off running to the end zone. I was like, I'm about to score on this first play and disrespect everybody. And I'm running, and out of the corner of my eye, all the way across the field was somebody way over here. And I remembered that conversation with my dad. And I said, you know, it's early on in the game. I could probably score another touchdown. Right now, I'm about to let this fool know what's up. So I was running to the end zone, and I said, no, brother. I literally, mid, mid running, I was running, I turned, I ran straight at him, and I slammed him in the head, and I fell over, and I stood up over him, and I said, you ain't gonna punk me no more. Can I tell you? Some of you today, when you get access to power, when you understand that God is on your side, you're going to stand up and say, devil, you can't punk me no more. You ain't going to punk my purpose. You ain't going to punk my family. You can't talk about me like that. You can't come. It's the power. It's the power of the Holy Spirit. It's the thing that makes the difference. It's the thing that makes this possible. And as long as you leave without that, you will keep coming back in the same spot. You'll face the same giant over and over and over again and be frustrated talking about, God, where are you? God, where? And the Holy Spirit sitting over there like, yep, just waiting. I'll be over here whenever you want. And the crazy thing is, is you actually know the Holy Spirit. You do. I, I would bet my life that you know him if you feel like you have any awareness of Jesus. If you have ever thought about, who is Jesus? I wonder who he is. The Bible says the Holy Spirit will guide you into all truth. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. So the only person that can make you aware that you needed a relationship with Jesus is the Holy Spirit. You, you've been talking to him for a while if you didn't realize it or not. He's called the helper. The one that comes alongside of you and it's it's the only thing that makes the difference. The only answer for the punk of the enemy is the power of the Holy Spirit. Only answer. It's not you trying harder. It's not you going to more church services. It's not you holding a welcome home sign outside. It's the power of the Holy Spirit. Now here's what I want to do. I want to take a moment and... Uh, in a moment, we're going to have a very special, powerful moment. I just want to share some things uh, that I believe are really going to help you. But right now, I really sense there's somebody in the room that you need to make a decision right now to surrender your life to Jesus. Very clearly, very simply, no fluff. I'm not trying to trick you, convince you. You've been searching for something. You've been searching for fulfillment. You've been searching for a level of validation. 
You've been looking for a piece of who you are in other people, in a certain amount of money, in a title next to your name, and it has not given you what you needed. Until Jesus is enough, nothing else ever will be. There are some of you in this room that the reason you're here today is to accept Jesus into your life. It's to surrender your will. It's to surrender your way. And in a moment, the Bible says you believe in your heart, you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you shall be saved. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to ask everybody to bow your heads and close your eyes just for a moment of focus. Just for a moment of focus and thinking about where are you in your relationship with God. There are some of you in here that you need to rededicate your life to him. Maybe you were following Jesus at one moment, but you've walked away or you've, or you've kind of ignored him. But in this moment, you can come back to him. There are some of you that maybe this is the first time. You're hearing the real story of Jesus, and the truth is he loves you. He cares about you. He believes in you. He believes the best in you. He sees more in you than you see in yourself. And regardless of what you felt about church, regardless of what you felt about God, he is passionately and, uh, and just absolutely in love with you. And all he wants is a relationship with you. Here's what I'm going to do. If you want to accept Jesus into your life, I'm going to ask you to repeat this prayer after me. The Bible is very clear. You believe in your heart, confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. You shall be saved. I'm going to ask you to repeat this prayer, and uh, in this moment, your life's going to be changed. Everybody repeat this after me. Say, Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for loving me. Dear Jesus, I need you. I can't do it on my own. I surrender my will. I need your help. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Listen, if you prayed that prayer and you meant it and you felt something on the inside of you, that is the best decision you could ever make. Your future is now secure in God and you don't have to worry or go to other places or look for other things because the creator of the universe, the one who spoke and put stars in the sky, the person who knew you before you were in your mother's womb, the person who has a plan and a purpose for your life, he just entered into the situation right now. And here's what we want to do. I want to take a moment. If you made that decision, you say, you know what? I prayed that prayer and I meant it. Maybe you prayed it before or you haven't, but you meant it like you felt something on the inside of you. I'm going to ask you to be bold. I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. Not to embarrass you, not to harass you, but I'm going to do that on the count of three. I want you to raise your hand. And there's already people raising their hand. Oh, my gosh. Listen, it's the best decision. If you made that decision, go ahead and raise your hand right now. I got you over here. I see you in the back, brother. Oh, hands all over the room. Come on, TC. Can we celebrate? The enemy has been working his whole life to keep you from that moment right there. He's been working so hard to keep you distracted, to keep you looking to other things. But right in this moment, you just made the best decision of your life. Listen, if you made that decision, I'm going to ask you to do something real quick. I'm going to ask you to text the word saved to the number that comes up on the screen. Text the word saved to that number. We're not going to harass you. We're not going to send you a text every Tuesday. All we're going to do is send you some resources to help you uh, and to explain to you what this means and how you can stay encouraged and about coming to church and different things like that. Uh, but we just want to encourage you now that you've come to know Jesus. We're so grateful you made that choice. Hey, listen, here's what I want to do. This is the most important part of the message. Most important part. Some of you in this room, you need access to power that you don't have right now. And I want to be very clear about this. The Bible is so clear about the Holy Spirit. And I want to just take a couple of moments and share with you who and what the Holy Spirit is. All scripture, all solid Bible, this is what the Bible says about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is, is the third part of the Trinity. Very clear. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. It says in the Bible that the Holy Spirit is our helper. He's the one that comes alongside of us. He's the one that stands next to us. He's the one that helps you face things that you couldn't face before. He's the one that helps you fight the giants that you couldn't fight before. In John 16, 15, this is what the Bible says. All belongs to the, to the Father is mine. And this is what I said. The Spirit will tell you whatever he receives from me. The, the Spirit of God, he helps you. He's there to come alongside of you. He's not there to scare you or to get you to run away. He is there to help you. The second thing, the Holy Spirit prays for us. There are times in life, and no doubt you've experienced this, where your words aren't enough for what you need. 
Let's be real about it. There are times and situations where you can't even get out of your mouth what you need from God. The Bible is very clear. This is where the Holy Spirit comes in hand. Romans 8, 26. And the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. For example, when we don't know what God wants us to pray, but the Holy Spirit prays with us in groanings that cannot be expressed in words. Don't argue with me. It's scripture. Holy Spirit, he gives gifts. You ever heard of the fruits of the Spirit? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. The goal of that scripture is not to get you to be a nice person. It's gifts that the Spirit of God gives you. Very clear. Look at this. 1 Corinthians 12, 4. And there are different kinds of spiritual gifts, but the same Spirit, capital S. Have you ever seen the word His in the Bible with a capital H? That means God. Capital S Spirit is the source of them all. He gives gifts. One of the gifts he gives is, is speaking in a different prayer language, or, or you may have heard it as speaking in tongues. And some of you got tight and scared and I'm worried. You, you can be afraid, but it's your power. Be afraid all you want to. Every single day I pray in the spirit. Every single day. I pray over my son. I pray over my family. Because it's the power source. And as long as you are disconnected from power, you will not be able to beat the challenges that you are facing. The last thing, the Holy Spirit gives us power. Acts 1.8. But you will receive power. Not, not some, not a little bit. You, you will receive complete, whole, full power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you'll be my witness telling about me everywhere in Jerusalem and throughout Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth. Some people think you need the Holy Spirit to go to heaven. No, you need the Holy Spirit to go to work on Monday. You... You need the Holy Spirit to stay married. You need the Holy Spirit to walk in your purpose. You need, you need the Holy Spirit to live everyday life. You need the Holy Spirit to fight the thoughts that has kept you caged in. You need the Holy Spirit every single day. It's your decision. And you can get batteries or no batteries. And you can look the same. And you can talk the same. But don't be surprised when the enemy comes for your power. He's no match. He doesn't stand up to God. There's no comparison. Here's what we're going to do. I'm going to ask the band to begin to play in just a moment. And some of you in this room, tonight, you will receive the power of the Holy Spirit. Not, some of you are like, oh gosh, this, I knew I shouldn't have come to this. Can I tell you that's the enemy talking? Very clearly. The devil is, the, you think God is trying to fight you from getting closer to him? Not his voice. That's the enemy. That's the enemy telling you this is weird and you need to go away and you should have left and you shouldn't have came to this service. We did it at all services, so you wouldn't have escaped it anyways. It's the power of the Holy Spirit. Here's what we're going to do. On the count of three, I'm going to ask you if you want to see the power of the Holy Spirit, I'm going to ask you to stand up out of your seat and come down to the front in just a moment. If you want to receive the power of the Holy Spirit, it's not going to be scary. It's not going to be weird. We ain't going to cast you out and throw you on the ground. No, we're just going to pray. All you have to do is in a moment, you just say, Lord, I receive. Lord, I receive. That's it. And I believe in a moment, you're going to see, receive access to power that you did not have before. Here's what we're going to do. In a moment, I'm going to count to three. And when I count to three, don't worry about what anybody would think about you. Don't worry if I already decided I wouldn't do that and that's not for me. If you want to be free or not, it's your decision. If you want to walk in power or not, it's your decision. So I'm going to count to three and I want everybody from all over this room, if you want to receive the power of the Holy Spirit, I want you to come down. One, he loves you. Two, this is the power you have been looking for. Three, come down all over this room. Come down, come down, come down. Hey guys, I know we just ended the message and what happened at that service was absolutely incredible. But we want to take a time to create an intentional moment for you to experience the exact same thing that we did in that service. You know, in that moment we were talking about the power of the Holy Spirit. And there are a couple things that the Holy Spirit does that I mentioned and I just want to reiterate them. The Holy Spirit is our helper. He comes alongside of us. The Holy Spirit, he prays for us. The Holy Spirit gives gifts and the Holy Spirit gives power. Listen, until you have access to that power, you will always find yourself struggling to face the things that God has called you to face. Here's what I want to do. In that moment, we took a second to pray over people to receive the power of the Holy Spirit. And I believe no matter where you're watching from, no matter what time it is, where you are, you can receive that power right now. 
So here's what I want you to do. I just want you to simply put your hands like this. This is a posture of receiving. If I was gonna give you something, you would have to have your hands open. I want you to put your hands like this. And in a moment, I'm gonna to start to pray. And I just want you to think and pray, say, God, I receive, God, I receive. And I believe in a moment, God's Holy Spirit can meet you where you are. Would you pray with me? Lord God, I thank you for every single person that is hearing my voice right now. Lord, I thank you, Lord, that your Holy Spirit is, is so powerful. It can go straight through a screen and enter someone's life right where they are. In a bedroom, Lord God, and at a house, Lord God, on a lunch break, Lord Jesus, wherever they're listening or watching, I thank you that your Holy Spirit would enter into their life right now. Lord, I thank you for a supernatural ability to, to hear your voice, Lord God, for a peace, Lord God, that comes from your Holy Spirit. Lord, I pray, Holy Spirit, that your power would enter into their lives. Lord, I thank you, Lord Jesus, even for people who are listening, Lord God, that are praying for the, for the ability to pray in a prayer language or to speak in tongues. Lord, I thank you your Holy Spirit is meeting them in this moment. Holy Spirit, we need you. I thank you for it. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Listen, I really believe that this was a special moment for so many of you. We are so glad that you are a part of Transformation Nation. You are a part of everything we're doing. We love you guys, and we will see you next time. Go out and live a transformed life.